Thank you all for being here. Um, Eric and I are really, I'm speaking for Eric. Eric and I are really <laughs> delighted to be here and um, to be having this conversation, which um, I guess both of us are just extremely excited to have this opportunity, so thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so, well, I would also want to begin um, with um, gratitude, first and foremost, to my ancestors, especially to Patrick Kelly um, for his legacy and for the work that he left. Um, <laughs> And I think also to um, thank um, the museum, uh, the curators of the exhibit, Dr. Steele, um, because of uh, the importance of recognizing people who have not been recognized. And I saw the um, exhibit, I wanna see it again, and I just, you know, I'm just overwhelmed um, with just gratitude for um, what it is that they've documented, and um, so thank you all for that. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to start with um, first talking about how we each came to Patrick Kelly. Um, in, in, in our work. Yes. Uh, so. um, I, Eric and I had a version of this conversation a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and um, we wanted to start with a little bit of a personal reflection. Um, for me, my encounter with Patrick Kelly actually happened um, when I was, I think, a teenager. And I grew up in a small town in um, sub southeastern Connecticut, um, a, not a very diverse place at all. And um, two, I remember very, very distinctly, I saved uh, two photographs that came to me um, in the local newspaper that I was absolutely intrigued by and um, cut them out and put them on my wall. One was a picture of Patrick Kelly and, um, and when I saw, I think it was, I, I told Eric I thought it was re possibly related to um, uh, the first campaign or the first, first uh, notice of him in Elle magazine um, sometime in the 1980s. I cut that out and put it on my wall because I was like, who is this man? And what kind of fun is he having? I was just sort of like very, very intrigued by the whole scene. I was like, this, this is a kind of really fascinating um, form of, of kind of black joy mm -hmm. that I actually was really intrigued by and felt like was some kind of a key to, to a kind of future that I was interested in. The other picture that I cut out um, was of Jean-Michel Basquiat. So I was also really very interested and in actually, I mean, it, it says a lot, I'm gonna have to work through that. Um, it says a lot to me about the kind of different way both of them were visioning, um, imaging and imagining blackness um, that for me was also associated with the city. So I was, you know, in a suburb and I thought, wow, that those two men, right? And the ways in which that they, they were um, representing themselves and kind of representing different black possibilities was really, really intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. How did yeah. you come to him? Uh, for me, uh, it was, uh, and I, I can see it, um, in the kitchen, my grandmother had one of those old televisions that just kind of sat in the kitchen while she was doing things, and there was um, Style with Elsa Clinch uh, was on, uh, and that's how I learned anything about fashion at mm -hmm. all. I was probably about 10 years old, and um, there he was being interviewed. Um, I love fashion, um, mostly through television, Dynasty, Falcon <laughs> Crest. <laughs> Yeah. Erica Kane, you know, all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'd never seen a black fashion designer, but I'd always known really fashionable black people, right? Right. Um, and stylish black people. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was, to me, the first kind of entry, right? That there right. was someone who was being interviewed by Elsa Clinch, you know, who was black. There was a kind of, you know, I, I guess then I would have said quirky. Uh, now being a scholar, I would say queer, right? There was yeah. a, a queerness about him that resonated with me. Um, and, you know, I just began to think about, like, you know, I wonder what his life is like and where is he from and things like that. So I think for me, um, in many ways, um, I tell people um, what I'm working on, which is a biography of Patrick Kelly's uh, life and work, um, I always say it's the work, um, even though I've just published one book, it's, this is the book I've been writing since I was 10 years old, right? right? Is, what I, is what I like to tell people. And I think my heart and my spirit certainly made it up in that moment that I was gonna do some kind of work or, or I would want to know something more about him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, mean, I think for me, just to add, I mean, I spend uh, a lot of my scholarly time thinking about the relationship between um, the ways in which black people are represented and the ways in which they represent themselves. Mm -hmm. So for me, Kelly and Basquiat were also really very, very important examples of what I felt were, were at that time, especially because I didn't know much about Kelly, I knew a little bit more about Basquiat, um, really important ways in which, which these black men were, were taking control of their self-representation mm -hmm. and really putting it out in front of the public in a way that um, that asked that was what I call interrogative. So these were they were asking questions. They were asking questions. What do you think 
right, um, a black person should look like. What, who is a black designer? Who is a black artist, right? How do we understand the kind of histories, um, the, the histories of where they're from geographically or um, thinking about their cultural histories that they bring with them to their work? So for me, it was, it was also um, about that question. Yeah. So with that, I want, uh, yeah. one image I wanted to um, sort of um, show for us to speak to um, right. that relates to what you were just saying yes. um, <laughs> is this is the um, uh, logo of Patrick Kelly Paris, um, the company. Um, it is um, the, uh, it's a gollywog. Um, and so the symbol was associated with the brand, but it was also, um, it appears on his tomb at Pierre Lachaise, which is where he's interned and he's buried. And at the time that the company was ascending and growing, it was something that people found really intriguing, but there were also people who had lots of difficulty and lots of problems with it in terms of the representation of, um, of, of blackness and you know, the, quite frankly, the racism um, of the iconography. So one of the things that I um, was really interested in asking you about is do you think that the image, even though it puts race front and center, um, does it actually obscure things about how Kelly talked about race and thought about race um, that we don't get to because the image is kind of like just there, right? right. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about this particular, the image on, um, that this image appeared on the bags from Kelly's store mm -hmm. and also on some of the labels um, associated with this list, but only in Europe and not in the US, right? right? Mm -hmm. It was deemed too controversial for the US. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about this image in contradistinction to um, the very similar image that's on his grave, because on his grave there's this gollywog image and then a heart, right? Um, which we'll see a couple of versions of, as well as the um, phrase, um, nothing is impossible, right? So that's the, what the grave looks like. So when I think about that, I think about, um, I think about Kelly, and we talked about this actually, um, the two previous um, uh, presentations, talked about the burden of representation. Right? This is how I think about it. Um, a black designer, and I think this is from the very first moments, I mean, is Elizabeth Keckley as well as Anne Lowe, really had to contend with, um, with representing the race, right? Um, Kelly being one of the first kind of active, um, really active and prominent black designers, in particular in Paris, really felt that burden. And I guess most, or you know, to really simplify it, when, when one feels that burden, when a black designer or, or a prominent black person feels that burden, there are a couple of different ways to address it. One way is to just go straight into it, right? And, um, and, um, and try to destigmatize it by using it and by repurposing it, by reappropriating it, right? The other way is to, um, is to kind of you know, try to sidestep those questions or address them in other ways that are, that are and I, what I found really um, wonderful about the exhibition that accompanies, that is based at the symposium is that there's, there are many, many different ways in which the designers in the exhibition that are noted, right, in terms of the ways in which they negotiate this burden, right? So in terms of the logo, I mean, I've tried to think about this in a kind of very scholarly way as, as the possibility or Kelly's possibility of thinking about what I've called kind of any chic, right? Is there a way, right, to repurpose such a, an image that has, you know, such a long history of, um, uh, of trying to stigmatize black people, um, infantilize them? It's often, this any image is often a, a child, right? Um, th these images were used as justifications for slavery and um, for the care, right, that black people needed um, uh, throughout the early parts of American history. So I try to think about, okay, so is there a way that Kelly is actually, is he, you know, destigmatizing the image? Is he putting Piccanini together with Chic, which I think he is, right, in terms of the way that um, this image um, was included on clothes that were absolutely innovative, right? New materials, um, body conscious design, um, the accessorizing that he did with his, with his fashion, right? So he's, he's doing something completely new and also attaching it to a really old stereotyped image. And it's in that conversation, I think, that, um, that he's on the one hand, right, um, bringing, bringing forward the history and the imagery associated with black people. And on the other hand, right, um, pushing that imagery in a, in a, in a new and a, in a very different direction, right? So for me, I don't think, I know the logo is controversial, right? Um, I do think that he couldn't avoid it, right? He was so interested in racist memorabilia, 
right? It, it filled his atelier, it was surrounding him everywhere, right? He would give out, um, as we saw in the exhibition, um, little uh, plastic black babies to all of the people that came into his atelier. He had them in his pockets, right? Um, so I feel as if, you know, there's a way in which his, his attempted kind of play with these images, um, his, his real kind of deep dive <laughs> into it um, is in some ways bringing the elephant that's in the room out, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in some ways, in such an exaggerated way that he actually in some ways didn't have to talk about it, yeah. right? So it makes it present, right? Um, and um, the way that he kind of took it, <coughs> ironically, playfully, ironically, troublingly, problematically, but he let that all kind of be present. And to me, I'm not sure he could have done anything else. So, I, and when you look at um, the work, right? Right, I mean, it, yeah, it exactly. It bears everything that yeah. you're saying, right? So for mm -hmm. him, you know, he just did not want to be um, limited um, no. as an artist or as right. a person by, It was non-compliance. Yeah, in many ways, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So racism for him was something that he was very vocal about. I mean, people, I interviewed people who went to middle school with him in high school. Mm -hmm. He was always, you know, very, very vocal about clear. It and very clear. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, it, it really reflects, you know, what you speak to. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, ref uh, uh, yeah, so it really reflects what you speak to um, uh, in, in that respect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we take the next image? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Okay. This is Patrick Kelly's love list. Um, I had a question for, um, for Eric about this. Um, I wanted to know, as I said before, I, didn't, I knew less about Patrick Kelly than I did about um, Basquiat when I first encountered him as a teenager. Um, I wanted to know, what about Kelly's kind of unique background? I talked about the way in which he brought joy, right? Mm -hmm. And you could see that so obviously um, in, in all of his designs and all of the advertising for his designs. Um, what about Kelly's unique background enabled him, right, to bring such joy to his work? Joy and complication, right? I think that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of his runway shows, which are kind of like parties, right? When I think of his runway shows and I think of Pat Cleveland kind of gallivanting around in the clothes, having an incredible time, right? Um, I see his whole process from the kind of idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a kind of a dress or an ensemble to actually putting it on a model and having that model animate <coughs> The mm -hmm. idea is really about conveying a certain kind of joy, right? I wanted to think. I wanted us to think about this love list. Like, if you could tell us mm -hmm. where the love list comes from. I mm -hmm. think there aren't many designers who have love lists, right? Mm -hmm. If we think about modern runway shows now, everybody looks very dour, right? <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm curious about you know where how the love list fits into how you see um, uh, Kelly's kind of attitude about his work mm -hmm. um, and and where that comes from in his own history. Mm -hmm. And Dower is exactly how he would describe what he thought of as some of what was happening before he kind of came on the scene. Oh, really? So it's okay. interesting That's that great. you yeah. He <laughs> saw himself through right. color, through humor, right? And right. Way, as exactly. kind of breaking some of that up. Mm -hmm. So The Love List was a document that um, Patrick Kelly wanted to share um, with people. Um, it would be a part of like kind of like those swag bags you would get at a show. Mm -hmm. um, so um, whatever other kinds of gifts that you got, this would have been also a part of it. Um, and, and it was distributed at the show, but sometimes quoted from. Um, so if you read Women's Wear right. Daily, if exactly. you read any of the press that would have been at the show, they would have also um, featured it, sometimes in full detail. Um, mm -hmm. The entire list um, would have been published and quoted from by writers and editors. Um, one thing that I want to point out that I think um, is a little, um, I'll get to the point about Joy, but that right. I think is really unique about the document mm -hmm. is that he didn't, he wasn't a writer. He did not like to write. Um, when you look um, at like written documents, at least in terms of the very few actual written archives that are available to other people um, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the general public, what you see are contracts and illustrations, <laughs> right? And marginalia and illustration. That is the written That's record, it. right? Except for this. Oh. And so the fact that you know this would be something that he would think would be important enough mm -hmm. to be shared, and also at the same time it is written, and he was not one, you know, for writing. Right. I think speaks to the importance of the documents. I just want to say that to kind of contextualize um, part of its um, uh, um, significance um, in terms of his life. I think it encapsulates joy because it articulates, you know, plainly and in many ways in repetition, things that he loves and he feels are important. There's food, there's music, yes. there's people, there's colors, there's gardenias. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, in many ways it kind of operates as like a kaleidoscope. 
right? Like of these different things mm -hmm. that sort of have their individual and distinct quality, but they also, you know, when put together, kind of change right. the color a little bit and tell us a mm -hmm. little bit more of how he's putting these things together that sometimes seem really irreconcilable, right? But for him, they make um, total and complete sense. Yes. Um, and they're the things that make up and sustain the happiness that he had, the, 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 sense, the effervescence that he had, mm -hmm. that he tried to communicate, like in the right. clothes. Right. And so when you say you see Pat, Pat, Pat Cleveland, you know, yes. gallivanting down the runway and mm -hmm. the joy, you know, I think that the Loveless reflects the things that kind of get us to that, that Get us that to that point. point. Yeah. Uh, and it is encountered by all who I think either encountered him or encountered his work. And that's something that is repeated over and over mm -hmm. again as I interview people. Um, the list also shows, I think, that he was willing to mine his background for, um, you know, the things that he would bring to his work. So many designers have a mood board, right? Mm -hmm. And he did as well from collection right. to collection. But I think of the love list as kind of like um, he, the mood board for his life. Right. Yeah, a meta so, mood. Yeah, so if you want to <laughs> yes. kind of like get into the aesthetic enterprise that is Patrick Kelly, you know, you want to know what that language is, you this is where here. that language yeah. starts. Yeah. And it doesn't end there, but I think it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, one of the things that I like about the list too is like the way that you said it's, I mean, I love the fact that it's I love Lucy and Lycra. Right? I mean, there's a real range, you know, there's high and low. There's alliteration. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, yes, there's alliteration also. Um, but there's a real high and low, and mm -hmm. I find that, I mean, when I think about the logo, that there's part of, the logo actually includes a, also a kind of conversation about high culture and, and, and low culture as well. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I'm really fascinated by the way in which, even though he was one of the first, right, he was, he was never going to kind of deny, right, where he came from. And um, and um, and people's questions about that, yeah. right? So it's it's a list again that kind of poses, I think, a series of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my favorite was dresses and spare ribs. If people, yeah. <laughs> I love that one. Right. Uh, so um, should we do the next one? Yeah. So oh. this was yeah. um, a part of the Patrick Kelly Paris ad campaign, mm -hmm. um, and um, the photos by, were by Olivero Toscani. Uh, and it's different than how Patrick Kelly is remembered, right? So what you'll see the yeah. next, I, well, I'm gonna show another photograph and you'll see how he dressed himself. Um, but generally it was the overalls, the, right. you know, biker's cap with Paris written across, you know, either a black or white shirt under it, boots or sneakers. Mm -hmm. um, and here he's completely, you know, not in that, no. right? Yeah. Um, and so when I look at this um, photo um, in my area where I, you know, do the writing on the book, um, I think of this as like if this were Paris is burning, he would be walking executive realness. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. And so, yes. Right. Yes. And so this is actually like a dream moment, like question for me, because oh. you were the first person that I thought about, like okay. that I would like to ask about this. Yes. Um, given your own important work on black dandyism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which um, Monica's work has helped us so much to understand so much about, you know, um, dandyism um, and um, black dandyism in mm -hmm. particular as a race and gender, gendered uh, sartorial performance. And I wondered how you would view Kelly as right. shown here um, yeah. as connecting with dandyism or disidentifying with that tradition in some way or... No, I think it's definitely connected, and I'm glad that you brought up um, executive realness because I think that's really important to this image. Um, again, I'm, I'm saying a lot about questions, but I feel like for me, um, dandyism is is an interrogative kind of methodology, meaning that it always asks questions. It asks questions about race, it asks questions about de gender, class, sexuality, and nationality. Often, right? So for me, um, this. The, the larger kind of meta question here is like, what is, what is the proper clothing for the black body, right? Mm -hmm. what, what, when we have fancy clothing on the black body, is that always mimicry, right? Um, is it always aspiration? Is, it al is there a point where black people arrive at the right, right, to, um, to be in these garments, right? The right to, um, to, um, to kind of occupy the clothing, right? And I think he's asking this question here in this, um, in this uh, photograph and also really asking it, I think, in the form of executive realness. So what I love about that in terms of the way that it imports, um, way that this photograph imports a conversation about ball culture, uh -huh. right, into, into, Kelly's, um, into Kelly's imagery is that, for me, I think realness is, um, is as a kind of sartorial performance, um, is both the kind of fantasy 
right? As well as, it's somewhere between kind of fantasy and authenticity, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's, it's moving between those two poles, right? So for me, um, Patrick Kelly at this point in his career is really successful, mm -hmm. right? He's, he's, this, is, this is the kind of iconic ad of, of the kind of height of Kelly's career, or one of this form of ad, right? Where he, he's around, surrounded by models, right? Mm -hmm. um, in his clothing. Um, so he's, he has actually gotten to the point of um, executive realness. <laughs> really, right? You know, yeah. he's, he, um, but at the same time, he's playing it as executive realness, right? So he's also, again, asking the question of like, have I arrived? Do you think I've arrived? Mm -hmm. What does it mean for me to arrive, mm -hmm. right? Is this my proper clothing? Mm -hmm. he, used these, he used the same um, uh, clothing for, as I think the same image or relatively same image as an invitation to one of his shows, right? Mm -hmm. So he's also interested in kind of playing, again, always, I think, with expectation, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is your expectation of a Patrick Kelly show, right? Um, are we all gonna be in a ball situation, right, where everybody, regardless of how um, secure you think your place in the hierarchy is, are we all involved in some version of, of, of um, walking a particular identity, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think this, this um, image is really, um, really a kind of part of that. It's a kind of wink and a nod, yes. right? It's a claim, mm -hmm. right, and a disclaimer, mm -hmm. right? I think all at the same time, and that's what I really, um, you know, if we can really think about Kelly and the way that he um, the way that he, uh, I think, represented himself, right, within the fashion industry at that time, um, as a kind of, um, you know, as a kind of a method, right? I mean, we can read him as a method, mm -hmm. right, for understanding um, the erased, gendered, and sexualized body, right, um, in, a, in a relatively hostile environment, right? So he, he's really kind of working many angles, right? Um, um, sometimes looking at things ironically, sometimes taking them very seriously, um, but kind of doing all of that simultaneously so as not to actually get stuck, right, mm -hmm. in an identity as the black designer. And when, yeah. when you talk about realness and thinking yeah. of realness as like intervention, right? Yes, um, absolutely. So like the intervention here. It's a disruption. I, right, is, it, is that he mm -hmm. in many ways is um, at that time in his life very famous and makes his yes. career on actually being photographed with his clothes. But there was some time when, before this campaign actually comes, mm -hmm. where there was the discussion about whether or not he should, he be should actually he should be in the ads. ads. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And he, you know, really put yeah. his foot down and was like, you know, yes. this is my house, basically. Yes. Um, and put himself in it. And so to me, that's really interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. on the one hand, he, he, he's good enough to be in it. Like yes. That that you know in this first editorial in French L that you know launches him, mm -hmm. but then by the time he's at this point, yes. it's like, oh, do we really want you in it or not? And, and so, he's like, well, I'll be in it in this way, and then you're gonna have to. I'm I'm asking the question, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. No, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay, we'll do one more. Oh, here's um, one of my favorite photographs of Patrick Kelly and his grandmother, um, Ethel Rainey. Um, this photograph really. Um, really brought to mind, and I know this is really um, the challenge of the work that you're doing, Eric, right? <laughs> about writing a biography of Kelly, right? Because I just talked about how he's very difficult to capture, right? And doesn't want to be labeled in any particular mm -hmm. kind of way, except for as successful, possibly, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, uh, so one of the things that I found in doing some of the research I've done about Kelly is the incredible um, self-mythologizing that he does and what we can kind of call in the African-American tradition storytelling. He was a really good storyteller um, and told a lot of stories about himself. So I was interested in this um, particular um, photograph um, because I wanted to think about what do we learn about Kelly's storytelling, right? If we take him back into a kind of, you know, into his kind of family origin, right? What do we learn from, what do we, how, do we, how do we read forward into the stories that he tells about himself, right? Looking at this um, photograph of him and his grandmother. Like, what drives him toward this incredible, um, again, it's joyful and exuberant, but also elusive um, mm -hmm. storytelling about himself and about his history. Um, like, what is, what is that about, right? And, and also kind of how have you dealt with it in your, um, in your work? Yeah, so I think that um, what we learn um, from this photo um, is, you know, the function that his grandmother played in um, creating the legend that is Patrick Kelly. Yeah. So in the picture, you see the affection and the love, yeah. you know, between mm -hmm. them. Um, and I love her button. Yeah, big so button. she's wearing the, the um, uh, brooch, mm 
Um, mm-hmm. And also the top, I'm pretty certain, is also Patrick Kelly. Oh, really? He is fashion as he always, you know, is. The mm-hmm. overalls, the white shirt that I mentioned. Right. And um, so um, what I love about this is that um, he is here, Patrick Kelly, right? The clothing um, that we associate mm-hmm. with him, um, though informed by sharecroppers, informed by, you right. know, messengers. Uh, and it's of a high fashion designer. That is, in fact, who he is. And Ethel Rainey, you know, though the industry um, would not recognize her as the muse of a high fashion house, she is, in <laughs> fact, the muse right. of a high fashion house. Um, and not for one season, for every season, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I just love that um, in this picture, he is tethered to his roots. Right. And she is tethered to an industry that did not anticipate her no. or her grandson. No. Um, and so that's what I love about this picture. Mm-hmm. Um, so she created, in, um, in terms of storytelling, she created the initial environment that allowed him you know, to project himself mm-hmm. into his future, right? I always right. think of her, you know, in my writing, I talk about her as being kind of like the incubator you know, for mm-hmm. the business that became Patrick Kelly Paris. Um, she was the one who gave him the fashion magazines um, that she got from the homes of um, wealthy um, um, white people um, she who she for. worked for. She encouraged his sewing. Mm-hmm. Um, she, you know, embodied style. Um, and most importantly, she was the one who said to him, you know, he wondered as a child, you know, why are there no, you know, black, you know, people in these magazines or black women in these magazines? And she said, well, people don't think that black women are right. important enough to design for, right? And right. he never forgot that. And that right. really just shaped, you know, the, the business and, and what it became, right? So black women are the center of everything that he is about. And not mm-hmm. just famous black women, all black women, right? right? He loved all women, but really black women became, you know, the center mm-hmm. of the work that um, he did. And the clothes really reflect that in the terms clothes. of just the way that they, they um, are, are flex, like they're flexible garments, yeah. right? And the runway reflects it, right. right? This like challenge that people have finding black models was not challenging. Um, no, <laughs> it wasn't. Apparently, um, right. he emphasized this um, by flooding the, mo- the runways um, with um, black models, models yeah, um, featuring cool. them in the ad campaigns. So, mm-hmm. you know, these are the ways um, I think that he was able to create counter stories yes. that allowed him to be resilient, right? Um, to go back to where we started, right? mm-hmm. that there was a narrative and a story around race and racism that he was informed about. He you know, studied black, black history right. and, and had lots to say, but he wanted to relate to it in a way that enabled him to kind of, you know, you know push through, right? right? Um, not just for himself, but for other people. And so those dominant stories, as painful as they are, don't define who he is and define the work, and mm-hmm. also the people who engage with the work and are around him. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So I think... I think we're gonna, yeah, yeah, we I think our time, time is yeah. up. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's been so interesting. Why don't we just have time for a few questions now, because I'm sure people have them. Okay. I wanted to start by asking, what influence you think Patrick Kelly has had on subsequent generations of black designers? I mean, I'll say just a very little bit of that. This might be an Eric question. Um, (laughs) One of the things that I found so so amazing, especially when you look at um, his designs as a group, right? and to think about the origins of the part of his origin story, right? I mean, it has to do a little bit with street fashion, right? I mean, he's, he's one of also, um, as much as he's one of the first people to get in, um, to be, be voted into the kind of ready to wear um, syndicate, he's also one of, the, one of the people who took fashion, you know, from the streets to that place, right? So I think it's just that, it's that possibility, right? When you said that you saw him on Elsa Clench, right? I mean, it's sort of, I mean, it's so important that, um, that he was visible and that he put himself out there even though it was risky, right? He put his whole self out there even though it was risky because I think he was actually doing, he was trying to do the work, right? Um, that he felt was necessary not only to kind of claim a space for himself but also make, to make space, right? For other people who were, who were um, using their, um, uh, you know, grandmother as muse, right? But also using their friends, right? Um, uh, and the kind of material deprivation, right? That young people, you know, trying to make it in New York might have had in the, you know, kind of late 1970s. Using that energy, right, to kind of create, um, create a new wave um, in fashion. So I think, 
I think that's one, that's one thing that I've really seen. It's so obvious when you look at the uh, kind of early dresses and the, ways, the multiple ways in which a single garment could be worn, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you, it wasn't just about dressing it up and dressing it down. It could like transform, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of different <laughs> pieces, right? So there's that, yeah. there's that ability to kind of like have other people step into, right, the garment both actually and I think metaphorically that really, um, that for me seems to be um, a major part of his legacy. Yeah. And when I think of him, I do think of this question in terms of his, where he leads in terms of a legacy for fashion. But first and foremost for me, yeah. how I'm trying to understand specifically race as it pertains to his work is in relationship to people like Kara Walker, right, or right. Candy Wiley. Right. Um, and, and people who are pushing that envelope yeah. in terms and of use of, use of um, kind of really difficult imagery. Yes. And, yes. Yeah, historical. So there's that. But in terms of design, so one thing that was said about him um, by, there was a Reverend Eugene Callender mm -hmm. um, at his memori the memorial service for Patrick Kelly, which was held here at FIT, um, said that you know, what made Patrick Kelly so wonderful amongst many other things was that he took things that were not seen as beautiful mm. and uh, you know, made them beautiful. And he made that a part of his critical sensibility. Uh, right. And I think that that kind of encouragement is one that you know, I think yes. um, lots of people need in general. And I think a lot of designers you know, are um, working through that. And I think specifically black designers and um, designers of color, right? It, it is. For whom beauty is a really touchy, yes, I mean, exactly. or you so know, I think historically loaded category. Yeah, so I think yeah. he offered a way. Um, and I think also um, um, authenticity, right? You know, yeah. that he just was you know, always himself. There was a sense that he felt, you know, when he was performing, when buyers would come into the showroom and things like that. So there was a little bit of that. But, you know, <laughs> mostly, I mean, for the, he was pretty much always himself. And I think that there's always a narrative of making it um, being about how can you somehow mm -hmm. convince people that you're something other than, you know, who you are. So I think his legacy um, to the designers um, that many people enjoy today, um, contemporary designers, is, you know, that sense of, you know, authenticity. Not mm -hmm. necessarily just to be marketed, but for one's own pleasure, enjoyment, and affirmation, which mm -hmm. is important to the work. Yeah. Another question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, one thing you said, for clarification, you said that the um, that label that you showed wasn't used in the United States, was but was not. used in Europe. That reminded me of research <laughs> I've done in South Africa, and mm -hmm. there's a designer there who took the brand name Darkie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he changed the name because he found that in Europe that didn't work, that people right. were uncomfortable, whereas in South Africa it was accepted and perfectly fine. So sure. I just wondered if, and so that just shows us the mm -hmm. sort of, um, the importance of context, of course, and Absolutely. history. So can you comment any more about the dis difference between Kelly's reception in the US and in Europe? Mm -hmm. Well, one yeah, of the things ahead. I would say is that he, he sold more clothes here, right? <laughs> but, but, they all, but the criticism of the image and right. of, in general what he did with race also came primarily from here. From here. Right? So that to me, I, I, you know, I've always found to be you know, really interesting. When he signed a deal with Warnico, right, which right. became his manufacturer and took him worldwide, though he had already been selling you know, in you know, Bergdorf Gripman, for example, like before that, um, there, there was, I think, a sense of some kind of um, discomfort around how would the American market you know, respond to him. Mm -hmm. That, um, at least in terms of all the press that I've read, all the people that I've interviewed, you know, both here in the US and also you know, in um, France, was just not the case. Um, that people kind of yeah. had a way of talking about what you know the the race that was in his work. They they saw it, but the, it, they, it wasn't taken for all of the very I think cerebral and intellectual yeah. commentary that he was in fact making. And I think in America, um, what I've seen is that people saw it, um, and they either just kind of was able to share his perspective on it, or they just rejected it yeah. uh, outright. But mm -hmm. financially, the clothes still sold here. Yeah. I also think, I mean, what you say about context is really important there, right? I mean, the, the U.S. context for that image is actually really different from the, the uh, a European um, kind of set of resources to, to really fully read the same image, yeah. right? So, um, so it's not only about, um, it's like that label is like fascinating because it's not only about um, uh, context in which the clothing was sold, Right, um, but really about the different historical engagements that that the U.S. would have had with the history of slavery in those images versus, you know, um, a kind of European engagement with those same images. Right, um, some of those, some of that kind of real uh, racist memorabilia stops being um, stops being, uh, I'd say, made and circulated in the U.S. 
far earlier, right, mm -hmm. than it does in Europe. So it, there's, there's, um, there's a conversation there that I think Kelly is also possibly trying to engage. I mean, we see it from the, from the point of view of a kind of historical, you know, 50 years later, right, we can see, oh, he's, I'm, I'm reading like, oh, wow, he's really kind of like, you know, um, kind of ironically thinking about that in relationship to the folks who would have come to his atelier in Paris, right, and understood that it was not possible in the U.S., but I also see how it's, I, I mean, I completely um, agree that we should also take, take the kind of criticism of that image in the U.S. very seriously, right, yes. because, um, mm -hmm. you know, there are different opinions, as I, I said before, about how you handle right, um, racist imagery and whether or not it's possible to actually reappropriate it, right? I mean, if you put that label on a, on a um, you know, I mean, he didn't do couture, but like, you know, kind of like really high-end, you know, well-crafted, ready to wear, um, you know, what is the calculation that, you know, that we're making around that? That's, it's, it's it, the question remains, right? And I actually think he wanted to put it on the table and not answer it for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Where's thank you oh, for. Sorry. I Hi. wanted to thank you for the, the converse, this conversation. I just have a quick, my own quick Patrick Kelly story. Oh. As a naive um, undergraduate student at Howard University, once I graduated, um, I I had worked full time, and so I treated myself to a trip to Paris. Mm -hmm. And so after traveling around, seeing different things that week, the last day I actually went to his mansion in Paris, which was really a mansion. Remember I said naive, so I knock on the door, ring the doorbell. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. Someone, you know, um, employee, I'm sure, answered the door and, you know, asked who I was, what are you doing here? No, you can't see him. <laughs> and so while he's saying this, um, Mr. Kelly is in the back and he's like, well, who is that? And so he told him who it was and somebody just, and he says, oh, let her come in. Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> I knew and that. so because of that, um, I just wanted to share that story of not only of his professionalism, mm -hmm. but his, who he was, I believe, as a person. Mm -hmm. He invited me in, I saw his fabrics, I saw what he was working on. He gave me my button, which I'm wearing today, a, uh -huh. a, a pack of the buttons, and he told me to wear his button and, mm -hmm. and to let people know. And so I teach now, mm -hmm. and I tell my students about Patrick Kelly, Ann Lowe, Elizabeth Kelly, mm -hmm. and so forth. So I just want, it's, again, it's not just, it wasn't just his um, professional side. Right. I think like even with that picture there, that's a, a, a attribute of who he really was. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, hi, thank you very much. I think this was very emotioning, and especially for me because in those years I lived in France and I was working in a buying office and I was working for Saks Fifth Avenue. And I have to say that every single show we used to go to in Paris for Patrick Kelly was a moment. Mm -hmm. It was a moment yeah. of joy, of love, and emotion. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we never looked at his clothes other than true identity and true integrity of design. Mm -hmm. I never thought of Patrick Kelly like a black designer. Mm -hmm. I thought, I looked at him, and we looked, I can say we, because I have a lot of friends in the business, um, an American friend, of course, but uh, you know, we, we just looked at his show like a, an amazing designer. We never made any difference of his gender, for him being black mm -hmm. or anything. It was just an amazing talent. And it was a time where, um, you know, designers were very different from what you see today. There was a lot of individualism. So he was part of a group and of a moment. And when I see how fashion has, has evolved, you know, and I think of those moments, the only thing I can compare him to is the first show that maybe I saw by, um, you know, some American designer who started there years later. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's not about, it, it, of course you see differently here, but I really think that in France we just saw him like a huge talent. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.
I was also fascinated by the uh, the first um, uh, the conversation about jazz and, and music. Thank you very much. I lo and, and fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, speaking of Miles Davis, well, I remember one story because I was. Uh, raised in a family in France who loved jazz. My brother played jazz, and I was little, and I heard, you know, all those famous musicians when I was a child. And I remember one story about Miles Davis. He met, he had a big love, uh, love affair with a famous singer, most of you probably know her name, Juliette Greco. And when she came to sing in New York, uh, she gave a big concert, and she stayed at the, um, at the Waldorf. And you know what she said in her memoir? She wrote that um, it's the first time that she realized he was black, because when he came to visit her at the hotel, they never let him go in, mm -hmm. in those years. So I'm just making some kind of a relationship that's not really one, but that's whatever it is. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you so much for this very informative conversation that you've been able to share with me coming from Trinidad and Tobago and adding to my knowledge acumen. Specifically to Eric, um, I'd like to know as Mr. Kelly's biographer, mm -hmm. what legacy you think based on all the material that you've been able to procure in his life and the outstanding contribution that he has made to fashion that you think he has, has, has made? Wow. Um, I don't know that I have what I, I, I will hope to come to as the answer um, um, uh, because it's actually one of the sort of things that I'm sort of working through and one of my chief questions I ask people, which is he was only um, operating at the level that he was at for five years, right? And so part of what people had said that really made me say, like, I got to write this book, is they would say, well, because he was only there for five years, like, the house didn't have a DNA, right? He wasn't around long enough for there to be, like, a lasting kind of thing. And I disagree with that, <laughs> 100%. And so part of what I'm trying to prove, I guess, also speaks to your, the, your question, is, you know, um, what is the lasting contribution? So let me tell you some things that people have said. Um, that um, I think you know, I will speak to. Um, one person talked about this matter of street style, right? That in many ways he's a precursor for you know working um, in that tradition, bringing it to you know the runway, um, you know, well before lots of other people were you know capitalizing on that, working like within that. One person talked about stretch. Right, that literally he, um, you know, the, fa the fabric, right, yeah, and that he worked with stretch, you know, uh, and that that becomes a metaphor, not necessarily just for um, the fact that, you know, he would do things that had stretch denim, right, um, and also the tube dresses, but, you know, literally stretch becomes a kind of metaphor for the elasticity, yeah. like, of his vision, right, itself. So I think that there is also that. Um, I think that as far as, at least as far as I've um, sort of um, found thus far, is specifically as a black designer or a designer like working specifically in relationship to, you know, blackness, the ways in which he worked with, uh, you know, uh, the buttons, the, you know, the, right. the bows. People did things like that, right? right? Um, but they didn't do it in um, the way that he did, where he was drawing specifically from the South, from the black poor, right? And that, um, and yeah, the church, which he would say that, you know, the most fashionable people on earth are in a pew in church on Sunday, right? And that there's not a runway in Paris that can match it. Um, and so uh, I think in many ways, um, he like took these things that were seen as being ordinary uh, and, 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 and not having value and you know, didn't argue with people about whether or not you know, it had value. He showed it to you. He was a, you know, um, you know I'm, I'm just not gonna show you, I'm, you know, and I'm gonna also tell you. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, this is work in progress. I've, I'm, I've interviewed a number of people. I've been through every written archive, which are not many um, uh, that exist, but those are some of the things that I think that he, he gives, but it is not the answer I hope to give by the, obviously by the time the book is published. Thank you. Thank you.